Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I put these videos out to help keep you in the loop about all the latest Starship news, launch events and all the other cool stuff that happened over the past seven days. Lots to discuss once again, big milestones in the Starship program, a triple Falcon 9 extravaganza, three long marches in just as many days, an Ariane 5, a Chinese launch failure, a leaky spacecraft on the space station and much much more. Let's roll the intro and begin, starting off with Starship news. The residents at Boca Chica Village were all issued with a warning letter of a potential static fire event on the 15th of December, just like this one that Boca Chica Gal received. This was going to be Ship 24, given that Booster 7 was not on the orbital launch mount and there's still a lot of construction going on around Stage 0, like the burn extension. One thing I do want to quickly um, rephrase from last week's episode was my coverage of the yellow extension to the berm. This structure protects the orbital tank farm from the exhaust of the super heavy booster on the orbital launch pad. I worded this a bit weirdly by describing this as a yellow extension. Many of you correctly highlighted that the yellow part is just the temporary support for the concrete being poured underneath it. And you can see that this has already started happening with much of the yellow support now removed. And you can see how much steeper this top part of the berm is compared to the main structure. Anyway, bit of a tangent there. Bringing us back to the main event, residents were issued with a warning of a possible Ship 24 static fire and then would you look at that we got one we got one of the coolest official spacex drone videos that we've ever seen the drone was hovering directly above the roaring starship this was a single engine raptor 2 static fire test and it's good to see that all those structural upgrades that we saw ship 24 undergo over the past few weeks all held up well and all those re-added heat shield tiles appear to still be attached <laughs> it looks like ship 25 still has its payload bay door Last episode, I covered the fact that this walkway has been installed in front of the Pez dispenser and some holes have been drilled into the hatch, meaning that it's very likely that it's going to have a metal plate welded over it, like we saw with Ship 24. Not sure why work appears to have paused here, but from what we can see, it's still looking like the big seal is going to happen. Speaking of Ship 25 though, it's in the high bay and squeezed in next to it is Ship 26. Ship 26 has been an interesting one to watch. Unlike Ship 24 and 25, it doesn't have any heat shield tiles or any control flaps. It's just a big dumb booster. Speculation ranged from this being a test article to it being a temporary expendable upper stage for Super Heavy that SpaceX have quickly thrown together so that they can start launching Starlink V2, which can't launch on any other rocket, and this will allow SpaceX to also start flying Super Heavy without needing the Starship upper stage to be ready, in its reusable configuration at least. Even SpaceX seemed to change their mind about what this prototype was going to be. It initially began life seemingly with the plan of being a normal Starship, with full heat shield tiling like ships 20, 24 and 25 and it had aft flap mounting points as well but then SpaceX removed all of the nose cone tiles and welded the flap mounts shut leaving it with this weird spiky appearance. We're now thinking that this could be the first prototype Starship tanker and will likely be used for testing orbital fuel transfer procedures. In space fuel transfer is a vital component to the Lunar Starship program, but as of yet nobody has ever transferred fuel in space before, so it's a bit of an unknown technology at this stage. Liquid does do all sorts of weird things in zero G, hence the need for a test tank. Specifically, we believe that this vehicle will test fuel transfer by moving propellant between its main and header fuel tanks. And it looks like stacking of this vehicle is now complete. This is definitely one of the more interesting stories down at Boca Chica to be watching. The Sanchez inventory tent is approaching completion. Workers have begun installing the panels at the front of the structure. As mentioned last week, the framework at the ends of this tent doesn't allow for any large doors, so this tent won't be used for Starship barrel segments or any other big structures. It's presumably going to be used to store smaller objects, presumably things like Raptor engines or things like this fuel transfer pipe that we saw recently turn up at the build site. While Booster 7 continues undergoing final flight preparations, Booster 9 was rolled out of the Mega Bay and taken down to the launch pad. There won't be any static fires from this thing yet, it still hasn't had its engines installed, so expect to see it undergo no more than cryoproofing tests before being carted back down to the build site for engine installation. Booster 9 sports a few upgrades over its predecessors, most notable of which is the fact that this is the first Super Heavy to use electronic gimbal control for its engine thrust vectoring rather than hydraulic control. As for the next Super Heavy, Booster 10, stacking of its liquid oxygen tank continued last week. The liquid oxygen tank is now two-thirds of its full final height. 
Greg Scott has provided us all with some flyover pictures from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Over at the Starbase site, we can now see six tower segments in various stages of completion, which will form the third Starship Orbital Launch Tower, exact location still to be confirmed. We can also see the cable drag chain, which will be used to control the motion of the cables on the catch arms and their carriage, keeping them safe from damage and metal fatigue. Speaking of the catch arms, Launch Pad 39A's arms and carriage are still sitting around waiting to be installed on the tower, but it looks like we can see the beginnings of Tower 3's catch arms as well. The Star Factory building continues to come together, all the floor is poured, and the final segment of the building structure is going up. Construction of the high base still hasn't started yet, hopefully work on this should begin soon. Greg also captured some photos of the Blue Origin facility. It's a shame that Blue are so secretive with their project, it makes it hard to cover things like New Glenn and Jarvis development to the same level of depth that we can with Starship, but their Florida facility is certainly sizable, building work is just as active as Starbase, and so it's going to be great to finally start seeing orbital flight hardware, or just any hardware at all at this point, start emerging from those hangar doors. Now check out this shot of the SpaceX landing zones. There are two Falcon 9s here, one of which has uh, fallen over. I'm joking, that was terrible. But, yep, it has been an extremely big week for SpaceX's Falcon 9. From the 16th to the 17th of December, we saw three of them launch. Let's talk about that. The first Falcon flight was on the 16th of December, which launched from the Vandenberg Space Force Base, and this was the SWAT mission. SWAT is a joint venture between NASA and the French National Center for Space Studies. SWAT itself is an acronym that stands for the Surface, Water and Ocean Topography Mission. The satellite will map the precise heights of rivers, reservoirs and lakes, and track ocean surface features at an unprecedented level of detail and scale. This will be the first global survey of the Earth's surface water. Past satellites, such as the Topex Poseidon, have analyzed the variation in river and lake water surface elevations at select locations, but the SWAT satellite will provide us with a truly global observation of changing water water levels, stream slopes and inundation extents in rivers, lakes and floodplains. The data provided by this mission should improve flood and drought forecasts and help researchers better understand how the climate is changing. As for the Falcon 9, the first stage performed a return to launch site landing, touching down at landing zone 4, bringing an end to this booster's sixth overall mission. Having previously supported two national reconnaissance missions, the SARA-1 launch and two Starlink launches. The next Falcon 9 launch we saw took place on the very same day, this time on the east coast at Cape Canaveral. This was the O3B M Power 1 and 2 mission. Yeah, it doesn't roll off the tongue quite as nicely as SWAT. <laughs> this was the delivery of the first two satellites to the new O3B M Power Communication Satellite Constellation, which will replace the old O3B Satellite Constellation. The satellites were launched to an 8,000 km medium Earth orbit, and commercial service is expected to begin in the third quarter of 2023. The O3B M Power constellation will initially consist of 11 high throughput and low latency satellites in medium Earth orbit, which will provide multiple terabits of global broadband connectivity used in applications such as cellular backhaul to remote rural locations and simultaneous international IP trunking. The Falcon 9 first stage for this mission landed on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, wrapping up its eighth overall flight. The third and final Falcon 9 flight we saw last week has had a few more flights than that last booster. This launch was the first time ever that SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 booster for the 15th time. The payload was another batch of Starlink satellites, Starlink Group 437, which consisted of 54 individual satellites launched to the fourth Starlink Constellation shell, bringing the total number of operational Starlink satellites to 3,284. The booster itself completed its 15th overall landing shortly after liftoff on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, having previously supported the Crew Demo 2 mission, the Anasis 2 launch, 10 Starlink launches, 2 transporter missions and 1 ISS resupply mission. So how SpaceX's goal of 60 launches in 2022 looking? Well, that latest Starlink mission puts the current number at 59, only one more to go. And SpaceX are, in fact, planning on launching two more Falcon 9s this year, the first Starlink launch for Starlink Shell 5 and the Eros C3 mission, which will be the launch of an Israeli Earth observation satellite. These launches will take place on the 28th and 29th of December, but of course this is subject to weather conditions and stuff. Hopefully at least one of them will go ahead as planned so we can hit that magical 60 number. 
Will SpaceX do it? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, if you are enjoying the video so far, then you know I gotta shamelessly ask you to like the video to help support what I do here. I always do appreciate it. Another awesome launch we saw last week was the ESA's flagship rocket, the Ariane 5, which blasted off from the French Guiana spaceport on the 13th of December, carrying the Galaxy 35 and 36 communication satellites, as well as the European Meteosat third generation Imager 1, which, if the name didn't give it away, is a meteorology satellite. Its operators, UMETSAT, state that it will revolutionize storm prediction, enhance weather forecasts, extend climate records, and provide a wide range of assessments essential observations. All three payloads were placed into a geosynchronous Earth orbit. The day after Ariane 5, we had a maiden launch of a new rocket. This was the Chinese Zhuche 2, built by Chinese private space company Landspace. This was their first liquid-fueled rocket, carrying 14 rideshare payloads. Now, unfortunately, the rocket's second stage suffered from an earlier-than-intended engine shutdown, preventing it from reaching orbital velocity and ending the mission in a launch failure. And because this is China, no official videos were released. I had to cobble this bit of the video together using leaked footage, so if everything was blurry, it's because I had a copyright claim and I had to sort of censor the footage. Despite the launch failure, this is a historic mission because this was the first launch of an orbital-class rocket fueled by methane. So it's definitely got that going for it. Now, luckily, the other three Chinese rocket launches we saw last week were a bit more successful. To rattle them off, on the 12th of December, we saw a Long March 4C lift off from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center, carrying two technology demonstration payloads to low Earth orbit. State media describes the satellites as platforms for on-orbit verification tests of new technologies such as space environment monitoring. The next Long March launch we saw was on the 14th of December. This was a Long March 2D, carrying three Yaugen 36 satellites to low Earth orbit. The Yaugen satellites are understood to be for reconnaissance and are bankrolled by the Chinese military, though state media does maintain that they are used for scientific experiments, land resource surveys, crop yield estimation, and disaster prevention and relief. The third and final Long March launch of the week was on the 16th of December. This was a Long March 11, which lifted off from the Zichang satellite launch site, carrying a single technology demonstration satellite to low Earth orbit. State media reports that the satellite was placed in the planned orbit and will be used for in-orbit verification of new space technologies. Very descriptive, I know. <laughs> now, things weren't as smooth sailing on the International Space Station last week. On the 14th of December, an apparent coolant leak saw the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft visibly streaming flakes into space. This is believed to have been caused by a loss of pressure in the external radiator cooling loop of the vehicle. Luckily, the leak posed no danger to the crew of the space station, and for now, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, is closely monitoring the spacecraft's temperatures, which so far remain within safe limits. External imagery and inspection plans are ongoing, and an inspection with the station's Canadarm2 is being planned. So far, not a lot of information has been released, but if the spacecraft has been rendered unsafe for re-entry, then that leaves cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petelin, as well as American astronaut Francisco Rubio, without a spacecraft to get home, and crucially, without an escape vessel in case the ISS needs to be evacuated. There is every chance that the spacecraft is safe, but if it isn't, then a replacement will need to be sent. This would either be an uncrewed Soyuz from Russia or a crew dragon from the United States. And I'll be watching this story very closely. Some sad news now regarding Artemis 1. In last week's episode, we all celebrated the return of Orion, but not every aspect of the mission was successful. As you may have been aware, the SLS was carrying 10 CubeSats to the moon, in addition to the Orion spacecraft. One of these was the tiny Japanese Omotenashi moon lander, which was designed to demonstrate the feasibility of low-cost surface exploration missions, which was especially cool because it technically meant that Artemis 1 would indeed be a moon landing mission. Sadly, it was not to be. The satellite failed immediately after launch, and so Artemis 1 didn't end up actually landing anything on the moon, and smug internet nerds lost the ability to snarkily tell people that actually Artemis 1 was a moon landing mission. And I say this from the perspective of a smug internet nerd who was very much looking forward to be able to say that to people. Maybe it was for the best. <laughs> Laon Aerospace didn't release any new flight videos last week, but rest assured I'm working on a lot of Kerbal projects right now and I hope to release them very soon. I'm testing a dinosaur, a sea dragon heavy, not sure why, <laughs> and a little cargo plane thingy. Hopefully at least one of these works well enough to make it into a video. And hey, make sure you're subscribed down below so that you don't miss these when they release. Next Saturday is Christmas Eve, so hopefully I'll be able to make some sort of festive content for you, which is in part made possible by the generous names on screen. My Patreon and channel
channel members whose generous support allows me to keep on making these videos for you all. If you want to see your name there, then you can sign up using the links below. But otherwise, guys, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week, and I'll catch you all next time.